for another episode of Six Rotations. So happy to be with you once again, Daniel Gilman, Mick Haley. We are here in the middle of October, Mick, and once again, sponsored by SNA Sports, better equipment for a better game. But it, it seems to me, and we're going to get to the rankings very soon, we have a fantastic episode today. We are talking to the two-headed monster down in Atlanta. It's Julia Bergman and Mariana Brambilla. It's, uh, it's a fun week to be a Georgia Tech Yellow Jacket. They came out of this weekend unscathed. They came out of last week with a big upset. But before we get to them, before we get to the polls, Mick, it's, it's a little bit of a of a slow burn here in mid October. And you've, you've touched on it in previous episodes, kind of called it like the dog days of, of the fall with the poll as well. And with, you know, only one or two matches per weekend, really titillating the, the diehard fans, right? Yeah. It's a, as a coach, it's really hard uh, to get your team ready during this time and getting them ready for two matches is, is unbelievably difficult, especially if you're supposed to have won, uh, you're, you're ranked higher, the teams come in and your, your team has had those first four weeks of the season. They've been all excited. Now the next five or six weeks of the season, you just want to get to November and get ready to play to get in the tournament. It, it's difficult. So we're going to go through the poll per usual. Then we are going to open up our, uh, our segments, you know, wackiest of the weekend, upset of the weekend, different things like that. And one of our segments this episode is going to be a mailbag because so many of you fans have been vocal on YouTube and on Twitter asking for certain things or correcting us, which we love corrections always. And then we finish it off with what might be the biggest marquee matches segment of this season in terms of the biggest matches coming up this weekend. We've got two or three of them that Mick and I are ready for with our popcorn on Friday night, maybe Sunday afternoon. Uh, Saturday is a good day to schedule your date night. For you volleyball fans, it's not like the, the biggest slate on Saturday. So I'm just prerequising it there right now. Let's jump into our top 10 and the top five mix stay the same. Texas cruises. Melaney Parra had uh, that four ace in a row showing in the third set against TCU. Then you've got Louisville sitting at two. Wisconsin at three. Wisconsin made very, very quick work with, uh, with Michigan this weekend, a 3-0 sweep. Pittsburgh at four, Kentucky five. Ohio State does jump Purdue. They beat Purdue at home. And then BYU, Nebraska, Washington. It it feels like to me that we're getting into that zone, and you'll see it here. Let's go ahead and just look at the, the whole top 25. It's, it's an interesting one because, Mick, teams are not really going to move much unless you have massive, massive wins or massive, massive losses, something like Penn State, where they move up one despite – winning at four against Rutgers and losing uh, at, at Purdue by five. Yeah. When you get to things like you, you mentioned Friday night, you've got Ohio state versus Wisconsin. How are you going to move the loser in that, right. in that match, you know? So you've got that all up and down the schedule. Now it's very difficult. The one that I picked out though, Pepperdine went over for two in their conference. They played the other two best teams. They didn't come out on top. They lost two. They're still on the pole. Um, you know, that's uh, that's interesting. Creighton is really starting to take a downturn. You have to watch them in their conference. Yeah, we'll talk about Creighton on our upset of the weekend. But the uh, the WCC had had a very tumultuous weekend, right? Pepperdine took a set against BYU. So maybe that's why they're clinging on. And then USD wins in five at Pepperdine. And then USD survives in a reverse sweep against LMU. LMU takes a set off BYU. That's going to continue to be that that jumbling, you know, circle, but BYU does stick into the top 10. They're not loved by the RPI. They are above Nebraska, which will make a lot of, uh, a lot of our fans happy and a lot of our fans upset. But at the end of the day, Mick, when you pick out one or two matches from this weekend, is there, is there something outside the PAC 12 that really grabbed your attention? Because I know we both love the PAC 12 slate this past weekend, but walk me through something else. Well, other than the one that you talked about, um, I, I did enjoy Purdue uh, comeback. Uh, I thought that one was as much fun as anything. Uh, I was interested in Penn State, what they did uh, with their left sides. Uh, they did some different things. Uh, so I enjoyed that match as much as, as any of the matches that I watched. Yeah, Minnesota ended up uh, taking care of Northwestern in that rematch. Buckeyes beat Purdue in four sets. 
Penn State did drop a set against Rutgers. Nebraska swept Illinois. That was Illinois' first three-set loss this year. But I don't want to have to call it a must-win for Dave Shondell in that match on Sunday, Dave, uh, um, Mick. But I don't know. It felt like... If I think that lose, was a must-win. Yeah, right? If you lose that match, <laughs> you're probably not going to have a chance at hosting a regional, right? You're not going to have that opportunity to get into the top four. They come from behind. Jenna Hampton has an incredible match, the libero for Penn State. She had one play at 22 all in the fourth set where she collided with the up judge chair, kept the point alive. But then I think we really saw Maddie Cook growing into her own in that fifth set, a huge block at 7-5, a big point at 5-4. I was really happy that Paul and Missy were on site for that broadcast because there will only been a handful of broadcasts this season where the play-by-play -play and color have been there. I know BTN have sent a few. I think Connor Onion was on the road this weekend, so I was happy to see that. But man, I was so locked in. It really felt like a regional-style match there at Holloway, where you know that the fans are feeling the pressure of a loss against Penn State, a team that I think is very uh, comparable to the New York Yankees, Mick, where they're bringing in all the talent. They're, they're getting Adonna Rollins and Erica Pritchard and all of these big, big stars. And Purdue's got the homegrown. They're like the Tampa Bay Rays, right? They use their own talent to come up. And that was a clash. But let's go out to the Pac-12 now, right? UCLA, the stunner of the weekend, where Arizona State finally, right? The Sun Devils have been so close so many times and they blow them out in the fifth set. I think it was 11-3 at one point. Yeah, that that was uh, just all Arizona State at that at that point. You know, the Pac-12 is interesting. You got UCLA, Washington, Stanford all at 6-2 in the conference and then you got Oregon, Utah and USC at 5 and 3. I mean, you've got what? Oh, I forgot one team. Washington State is also in that top 6 and 2. You got seven teams in the Pac-12 that are just banging on each other. And we don't even hear about USC in the polls. And Washington is the only one in the top 10. They pulled off their second top 20 reverse sweep. They beat Oregon on Thursday. Then Washington State smokes Oregon over the weekend in three <laughs> sets. But Oregon, you have to be not upset if you're a Pac-12 fan because you're seeing all these teams beating each other up, but the polls do not represent it in a way that is devastating to your conference because you've got 15 Stanford, 16 Oregon, 17 UCLA, 18 Utah, and Washington State holding on at 22. So you have to think that you're going to get at least three or four teams hosting the, the first two rounds if, if things go that way. Um, Baylor, Kansas was an interesting uh, series, right? You know, Jenny Mosher is, is really good for Kansas. I'm not sure, Mick, if they're going to be able to pull off this at large bid, unless they beat everyone else, right? What do you think in, in, in that I, I think that's exactly right. I think you've said it perfectly. I I don't think unless they have a run that's that's really special uh, that they can get in. Uh, the other conferences are too strong. They're backed up. I was looking at all the conferences today that are going to get more than two in, more than three in. Wow, it's going to be tough for, for some some of the other teams in the Big 12. And then we're going to talk to Mari and Julia at the end of this episode. But for, for the ACC talk, six feels unrealistic. Five feels a little bit more within the realm. Miami took a set against Pittsburgh. That is impressive in its own right. But we'll talk more ACC with the marquee matches because that's going to be the headliner. SEC talk. Florida's loss to Mississippi State, not looking as bad anymore. They're sitting at 23, Mick, but I, I have to... I have to say Mississippi State and, and, and Sam Gore, and I think all of Mississippi State's nation came on us at Twitter this weekend to just remind us that them beating Ole Miss wasn't a big upset. But I think the way they did it, right, coming down from two sets to none, surviving two match points, it felt to me like an upset because of the start that Ole Miss had and the fact that they beat A&M on, on Wednesday in five sets. Yeah, and they're hot right now. Uh, but the SEC is interesting. You got Kentucky at six and zero, Tennessee at seven and one, Florida at six and three, and then Arkansas and Mississippi State at five and two. I don't see them getting more than four, and they could get only three. I see. I I'm thinking four. I'm thinking four because I think Tennessee is is locked in right they're the 20 seed they've got a big one this weekend against lsu right lsu took a set against kentucky on thursday at home then uh they were swept on friday against kentucky 
Tennessee almost had a scare at Georgia. They came from behind to beat them. So they're still sitting in that top 20, but you're, yeah, I, I think four is a good number for the SEC, but then where are we picking away from, right? Are we picking away from the bottom of the big 10? Maybe are they only going to have six instead of the usual seven or eight? It's going to be very interesting with LMU putting together a very, very strong season in the WCC. It'll be hard to leave out the lions. Yeah, I know they're having a special season for sure. And they're challenging those other top three that have been top three for a long time. And they're doing a good job. You mentioned the big 10 though. They, unless Illinois or Michigan, either one, not both of them, steps up and wins all of the rest of their games or upsets some of those, they are going to end up beating each other up and yeah. maybe not get in. And that's where the Big Ten may only get six. Illinois and Michigan both receiving votes, as is Miami and Marquette. Colorado, Rice, Florida State, the other teams in the RV category. But I'll tell you where a lot of those bids are going to come from if you look back at the 2019 tournament. And that was a three bid Big West season. We're only getting one Big West team in. I can tell you that right now. It's going to be the winner of the Big West. It's probably looking like Hawaii. They are dominant. I, I had a, a late night broadcast on Friday, Mick. It was a, a 10 p.m. Pacific time first serve. Hawaii swept the floor with Cal Poly. And then UC Santa Barbara got upset by Davis. So now Hawaii has a one-game lead in that Big West conference but oh, uh, um, I, I GB, the middle from Louisiana is a superstar out there. And then they've got Van Sickle from Oregon and a freshman setter who took over midway through the season. Kate Lang feeling very comfortable, reminding me a little bit of Nicklin Hames in her style and her poise. So Hawaii is a team that's that split with USC that beat Texas A&M early in the season. So that's a team to keep an eye on. I, uh, I wanted to talk Big West talk. And, and I want to open up our mailbag here before we get in. We're going to switch around a little bit before we get into our segments, because it ties in so beautifully. We've got people commenting and clamoring. Andy Alvarez wants Big West coverage. Here you go. Well, it's tough when your conference is the worst in RPI for us to give it too much love, right? Well, we're going to do a little bit of Big West coverage. I think unless something crazy happens, like a Santa Barbara upset over Hawaii, I don't know how much more uh, conversations we may have about the Big West. Um, and Domingo has a correction for you. He says, uh, Ogana Namani was the, the player that you were trying to think of Absolutely. last week. Absolutely. And I, and I love Ogana and I'm sorry when I was playing against her, you know, I knew that name perfectly. Of course, of course. And then, uh, they also say, would love to see a tournament that matches up the top eight teams in the PAC 12 and the big 10. That would be cool. Right. Just having like a, a, a singularity, uh, tournament between the PAC 12 and the big 10. I don't know how that would happen. Um, they also say hitting in the 200 range against Rutgers did not prevent present a convincing case for Nebraska to be a top eight seed. You're preaching to the choir, Domingo. You are uh, preaching to the choir. Also, I saw that the uh, the NIVC is back for another season after taking off the 2020 2021 season. So that's a great tournament. I think Georgia Tech went far in it a couple of years ago, and it obviously prepared them well. What do you think of the NIVC? Well, I think it's a, a good developing tournament, but I think administrators are not going to send your team there two or three times. They'll use it as a builder, especially if you've got a bunch of young kids, you don't get into the NC2A tournament and you need something to get a little bit extra with your, your group or a group that's coming on late. Uh, I, I really like the tournament for that reason, and I think it's good. But if you were supposed to be in that NC2A tournament and it didn't happen, uh, I, think, I think you're going home. Yeah, a team like Colorado, I, th I think, made a big surge a couple of years ago in the NIVC, and it just prepares you with some postseason action. And then lastly, Taryn Rodriguez says, don't sleep on LMU. They had a great weekend last week, just fell short against USD. And then they had a great weekend this, this past weekend. They just couldn't quite do it where uh, they take the set off of BYU, but BYU continuing to surge forward. And then uh, we got a couple segments here. I, I, our, our interview is long, so we're just going to cut this episode a little bit shorter than usual so you can get the full entirety of our Georgia Tech talk. But Mick, you texted me about this. The fans were clamoring. We sent out a poll, and the winner of the poll of Upset of the Weekend is UConn. Their first, and so it, it fills Upset of the Weekend and First of the Weekend, their first ever win against a ranked team for the Huskies out in Connecticut, and they come back from down 2-1 to beat 19th ranked Creighton at home. What a win. So now St. John's and UConn have proven that Creighton has blemishes. 
Well, good, good for the the Big East too, because that gives them now five teams, uh, including Villanova, that have been in the top group there. So their conference is going to get continually better because now they've got five opponents that are playing well against each other. So I, I like that conference a little bit better now. I do too. It's it's something that you got to keep an eye on. The fact that St. John's is competitive and obviously Marquette is a team that deserves to be ranked. They're sitting at 26. And then our wackiest of the week, and this was a great stat that I saw from Ed Strong, a big Washington fan who runs the NCAA Volleyball Scores account. He said Washington has won five straight matches despite losing the first set in all of them. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And it's visually, um, you can actually see what happens to Washington. They just can't get those bodies moving. I, I think Coach Keegan might want to think about a different warm up or something. He needs to get those bodies. Whatever going works, because, right? You don't have yeah. to win the first set. Yeah, ex- actually. But by the third or fourth set, and usually the fifth set, they're all tuned in. They're they're like machines going. So uh, it's an interesting phenomena. I think uh, you have to look at things like that. And then rapid here at the end, our marquee matches of the weekend, Mick. And it, it starts on Friday. You take a look at it here. The, the premier one has to be Ohio State at Wisconsin, a matchup that if I don't if I remember correctly, I think it got canceled last year. Was that what it was? There was a lot of talk about the big matchup between Wisconsin and Ohio State. I'm not sure if they I think did both so. of us. I think Ohio State had two weekends in a row. Uh, yeah, canceled. Minnesota, too. Right. I, I don't yeah. I don't you can't exactly. Hold that against me if, if it's not correct. I'll look that up in a little bit. And then San Diego at BYU, another, uh, you know, WCC brawl that could be fun. Talk me through a couple of these, right? Penn State, Minnesota, Oregon, UCLA, as well as uh, Pitt at Notre Dame on Friday. Well, don't forget Stanford and Washington State. Washington State is maybe the hottest team. They had a player this last weekend that was unbelievable. Middle blocker, Magda, and get this, I may get this, Lahala Shava. Yeah, Lahala okay. Shava, you got it. But she was like radar. You could she, she all she had to do is put her hands up and she'd get a stuff block. She scored 16 and a half points in a three game sweep by Washington State over Oregon. It was amazing. It was just her show. And uh, Washington State, as I said, is hot. So watch out Stanford. And speaking of points per set, there's a very cool thread on Twitter from at Cheese Trader friend of the show, great, you know, addition to the volleyball world that really dissects the points per sets by each team and how some have more than others. You'd be surprised by how the Pac-12 does in that listing. So go ahead and check that out on Twitter. We'll retweet that. And then the big one, right? Sunday. It's our it's our Super Bowl Sunday of the month. We've been waiting for Pittsburgh at Louisville. You know, Ohio State, Minnesota could be fun. Stanford, Washington is solid too, but Pittsburgh at Louisville, sign me up. You just have to hope that that Pittsburgh gets through Notre Dame first, who just lost a terrible one against Wake Forest. So the Irish are on must win watch on Friday. Where do you give the nod to in Pittsburgh, Louisville? Well, Pittsburgh lost the match to Georgia Tech. They didn't think they were going to lose. So I think they're really up for this one. And as you'll hear in our, uh, uh, Next segment, uh, the players that we're interviewing think Notre Dame is pretty good. Um, And somebody else thinks that Wake Forest is much improved. So Pittsburgh cannot look past their their opponent Friday night before they get to Louisville. Louisville, on the other hand, they have Virginia hasn't hasn't lost. You know, everybody's going to lose a game. Maybe. Wouldn't it be interesting if Louisville and Texas ended up undefeated? Well, Louisville, and we'll we'll end it with this, they still have to host Georgia Tech. They go at Notre Dame. They go at Pittsburgh and versus Notre Dame in the last two matches of the season. So they still have to go to Fitzgerald on Thanksgiving week. And so just because a win here would not, in my mind, think that they are going to go undefeated. Texas is a whole other story. I think they are favored in, like, if you were to bet in Vegas whether Texas would go undefeated or not in the regular season, the the smart money is all going to be on that they will go undefeated, while Louisville has a lot tougher of a journey. But we are excited to talk about it early next week. It should be fantastic. Pittsburgh, Louisville, Sunday afternoon, lock into it. Get some multiple screens going. That should be great. May want to keep an eye as well on the uh, that SEC battle over there, right, in Tennessee at LSU because the Volunteers, if they, if they win that one, it feels like they are legitimately locked in for the tournament run in my mind. Well, don't, but, don't forget Louisville, uh, excuse me, uh, LSU split with Florida two weeks ago. They did. So Tennessee they did cannot the- take that lightly. 
No, no, that should be a fun one. What's also fantastic and a lot of fun is our talk with Julia and Madi coming up next. The Georgia Tech stars, both Brazilian, both fiery. And so Mick and I talk to them coming up next in our Around the Arena segment. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And yes, I added some stuff to my background. So finally, there's not just a white wall behind me. I know a couple of you have been clamoring for that. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, here's our interview. Welcome into our Around the Arena segment to wrap up this episode of Six Rotations. And Mick and I are very happy to be joined by a pair of our All-American Watch List members, and that's Julia Bergman and Mariana Brambilla from Georgia Tech, coming off of the big upset last week against undefeated Pittsburgh. Julia, Mariana, how are you guys doing? Very good. good. <laughs> Thank you for having us. No, we're happy to. We're, we're recording this kind of mid midweek, late week after the win over Clemson. And, and when you guys have, and I'll ask you first, Julie, when you have a Wednesday and then a Sunday style of week, do you prefer that to the back-to-back Friday, Saturday? I mean, it's pretty tough to play Friday, Sunday, and Wednesday. It can be really exhausting, but I think now we have that kind of break from Wednesday to Sunday, so that's nice. When it comes to prep, Mariana, you know, the differences between prepping in high school or for international tournaments and then having to study, you know, Clemson and Duke back to back, as opposed to having a few days off. Is that a big advantage? Um, I would say yes. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, we have some time to watch film and to prepare and, and to adjust some things in practice from the game from Wednesday. When we can do better during the week to get to Sunday prepared. And for those for those that don't know, and I don't know how much. Georgia Tech volleyball, a lot of our fans have watched, but almost every broadcaster likes to talk about it, right? The, the Brazilian connection, um, Michelle Collier, the, the head coach for the, for the Jackets, and then both of you have, have a lot of Brazilian background, Mariana from Brazil and, and Julia, who played back there before going to college. How much Portuguese is spoken in a practice? You know, <laughs> is it only when you guys are, are very intense in the middle of a match, or do you try to keep it English all the way? No, every I mean, time I'm gonna talk, every time I'm gonna talk to Julia, I I can't talk to her in. <laughs> it just feels weird English. talking to her in so English. I have to yeah. talk in Portuguese, and now even even yeah, it just feels really I can't. And then um, even with Bianca and um, Paola, I I have to speak in Spanish with them during the game. So that's funny because sometimes we are in the net and we don't have to worry about the the other player in the other team understanding what we are going to do in the next game i just say well julia do this this and that um watch the block here and the other team is not going to do it you know what uh, huge huge advantage and then here before i hand it over to mick you know ever since we started doing these these previews back in the regionals of of april mick has always struggled with your name madi so let's give a little bit of a tutorial right how are we going to get through the name for the rest of the year because i have a feeling we're going to have an eye on georgia tech all season (laughs) Okay, it's um, Mariana Brambila. All right, you got that, Mick? No, nope. No, let's hear it. But I'll fake it. I'll fake it. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, I have. Or you can just say Mari. Mari. That works too. Yeah. Mari would be great. And you can go by that. Uh, you know, a lot of times in Brazil, you only have one name when you're an athlete and they call you, right? Because yes. everybody knows who that is when you use yeah, exactly. that name. Yeah. But I have a question. You know, I, I love watching the huddles. I love watching the timeouts. And you have an assistant coach that he gets in the huddle and he doesn't stop talking until the three minutes are over. So, uh, and I'm trying to read his lips, right? And I can't get it, but his hand <laughs> signals I get and I figure out stuff. So how much of that information can you possibly digest? Tell me about that. I mean, we Brazilians, we always talk with our hands. Oh. Everyone says <laughs> it's that. Always it's always a lot of information. Pressures. It's always, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think he, he gets his board and he starts drawing everything on his little board, like the courts. And sometimes you just say, oh, yeah, I got it. I got it. And you don't understand anything. But <laughs> you just absorb the important information and the rest is just, he just talks, I guess. I had, Don't tell I had... us our coach. <laughs> When I was coaching the Olympic team, I had a lot of outside help. You know, people would come in to teach teach me to uh, do better with teaching, uh, learning theory. And one of the things they said is if the teams come out of a timeout, they only come out with one thing, 
and yeah. maybe one thing to think about. And you really don't want them to think about two things. You want one thing. And so I watch that and I say, what one thing is your team getting from that time out? Uh, and, and I see him doing this to you and then over here at the money. And, and, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to see then what happens, but, but you feel that uh, that's okay. You're working with that. All right. Mm -hmm. the, the second question I had, and, and this was, this was pretty good. I loved your intensity against Louisville. That match was so much fun to watch. I have to tell you, uh, both teams were excellent. You guys were great. Um, who was the toughest? Who was the toughest player to play against in that match? Louisville or Pitt, Mick? Louisville. Louisville. Okay. Oh, Louisville, I think they have a really good Middle. uh, middles. Yeah. yeah. That's really, and their defense is just yeah, it's very amazing. Um, yeah. I feel like they have been playing great volleyball this, this year, last season, but definitely their middles make a huge difference. And then with Pitt, who gave you the most trouble? Um. I would say the right side <laughs> a lot with her shots, but um, also Kayla. I think they the, their whole team is really good. So I think like all of their players are really, really hard to play against. Their setters have like, they play really fast. And sometimes you move to one side and they set the ball to the other side. So I think it's, it was yeah. Yeah, really great. So, so the last thing I have is your conference has really taken a big jump. There's no question that three of you are in the hunt uh, and could get into the final four. But there's a really hard question. Who's the fourth best team in the conference? Oh, there are so many, all of our so teams many. are doing yeah. so great. I mean, do Miami is doing great. And also Florida, Florida, Florida. North Carolina too, Pete, Global. Who, who's um, coming on? Who do you, who do you think <laughs> is coming on the best? Who's, who really shows that they're getting better right now? Do you know? I feel Notre Dame had a rough start, but I feel like they're such a good team. They have really good players, and if they really get into a rhythm, they can be a really tough opponent. I mean, we played them already, and it was a tough match for us, but I think Miami, they have a great offense. I mean, they have a huge blockers. Florida State, yeah, I think our conference is doing really great this year. Do you think you could get six teams in the tournament from your conference? Are you <laughs> I guess i mean we have what three four now ranked and i yeah. think the other teams are really close to it so we'll see all right yeah i love i love when the players kind of you know tune in a little bit more like kylie murr with ohio state was telling us that she tries to watch as much volleyball when she's not playing is that something that, that you two will do you know will you try to catch a friday night match tonight <laughs> yes yeah. Oh my God. Um, even like uh, international volleyball, me and Julia, yeah, we, the European we watch all the international. Time. Yeah, we watched the European tournament, even the Brazilian league. Um, in the Olympics, it was volleyball Nonsense. all the time. All night, all day. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I remember I, all the time. Yeah. And so, and so you guys and started it's playing. Yeah, it's something that we got. Yeah, so you guys started playing together back in the in the eighteen U out in Brazil. When you watch, is there is there a major difference to you between the Brazilian, the the European, or the or the South American style and the American college style? Yes, yes, there's a lot. Especially here, I feel the volleyball is really fast. Um, uh, there's a lot of defense because it's it's a really physical game. So I think that's for me that's the, the biggest difference. Also, some of the rules, I mean, internationally, yeah. the ball cannot touch the ceiling. So that's weird. <laughs> that's the weird <laughs> when the ball touches, you have to continue. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when we, when we talked to, to Luca Slabe, who's the assistant coach for the women's team back in our, our first episode, he said the biggest difference is that everyone can play every position internationally. Oh, yes. yeah. And in America, it's almost like you're going to play outside. You're going to play middle. You're going to play libero. And so that's always interesting. I, I wanted to ask something fun. Is there, yeah, that's is there, true. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I played as a middle, as a right side already before. So outside and, yeah. is my third position. <laughs> I played, yeah, I used to play as a middle and then I played as an outside and then I played as a right side. I came here as an outside. I played my freshman year as an outside and then I went to the right side. So, and even now I play as a right side, but I depend on some sticks. So I do the back rows. So it's, it's, it's always like a different style of, of play. Neither of you set. No, right? oh, that was nope. the only thing. <laughs> but everybody wants to be a setter, right? Yeah, that's what that's I've heard. Exactly everyone who's not right. a setter wants to be a setter. 
And then I, I want to yeah, ask you, of course. it's right. Yeah. yeah. Julio, are, what, what are some, what are some wild kind of pregame rituals or festivities that you guys try to keep up superstition wise as, as, as a winning streak might go on? So one thing we always listen to the three same songs on the bus every time we go to the match. So it has to be the same song and like in a certain sequence every time. And well, I'm then, sure you know what the know. songs are, right? I mean, it's, there are Brazilian songs. I don't ah, know if okay. people know, but <laughs> what else? Oh yeah, if you, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but we always write something on our hand that reminds us. Um, it says the moment is now. I feel like that's really if you look at your hand and just think about that at the moment um it really brings us into the game again and that's one thing that we always do yeah and something funny was uh, that in 2019 there was a period that we were like with uh, winning we were winning a lot i think we won 10 games in a row or something and then we were like okay we gotta do everything the same <laughs> we gotta listen to it works <laughs> we gotta do this and we were the whole thing it was the whole thing we're like okay we're doing exactly the same thing are there are there a lot of superstitions like in brazil or germany because in america that's what we do right we don't change our underwear we keep the socks it's all the same <laughs> no not that i mean for sure i mean the same hair tie or the same passing pads we always do that i think that's everywhere i guess great well thank you so much julia Madi. i really appreciate it fantastic luck all season long they Thank are you. the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets rolling along. He's Mick Haley. I'm Daniel Gilman. Thank you so much for watching Six Rotations.